Thank you, team. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10, in which we see a little snippet in the life of Jesus. Um, Not very many verses here, six maybe, but how many sermons have been preached on this little passage? Luke 10, starting with 38, and ending with 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now remember, this is not Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, This was not Mary Magdalene. This was Mary of Bethany, whose brother was Lazarus, who was later to be raised from the dead. Verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord replied, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Little snapshot in the life of Jesus as he traveled around preaching at a time just before his final journey to Jerusalem, where he would soon die on the cross for sinners and rise again. And as he traveled around, he was supported in his mission by various people in the towns and cities where he went who believed in him and knew that he was the promised Messiah. And many of these people were women, prominent women, to be sure. In fact, it even says that the wife of Herod's chief servant, Cusa, was among those who supported Jesus in his itinerant ministry. And it is even believed, according to church tradition, that Procula, the wife of Governor Pontius Pilate, was a believer. And that is one of the reasons why she tried to get him off the hook and uh, the night of his trial have nothing to do with that just man, she said, for I have suffered many things in a dream because of him. And she might have been hanging out with some of these women in Jerusalem who knew something about this Jesus. And scripture supports that there are many women that followed him in old Jerusalem who knew of his reputation, starting even with the marriage feast of Cana, where he performed his first miracle, turning water into wine not only thereby proving his deity uh, in being able to perform such a miracle, but also lending approbation to the sanctity of marriage and dignifying women and showing to the world that he was happy at the marriage feast, same as anyone else would be, and yet without sin. I've uh, been to many marriage feasts, where there was sin, frankly, and, and yet it is possible to go to even a marriage feast and be without sin and be a good representative of the Lord. If you're pure in heart, you see, more pleasures are permitted to you. In your household, if your child, for example, is obedient and he shows himself to be respectful and follows the, the, the rules, Isn't it true that you will allow that child more privileges because he has shown that he can handle what is given to him? But if you have a child who is petulant and always trying to buck the odds and and jump the fence, you're going to tighten the noose on him, aren't you? Well, you know, God operates the same way. In Titus 1.15, It says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their hearts and consciences are corrupted. And so Jesus, with a pure heart, had many friendships with women, and they were 100% honorable and pure. And it's important to remember that because we are under attack today in this crooked and perverse generation 
Uh, it is hard for people to understand that Jesus' relationship with women could be anything but totally honorable. Some of the liberals today would like us to think that Jesus was just as sinful as they are. He wasn't. And while he was in all points tempted like we are, he never sinned, not even a little bit. And we must know that there was never any funny business going on with these two women uh, or the woman at the well or Mary Magdalene or any of the others that he had friendships with. So let's just remember that. Jesus raised the status of women in his ministry because before he came, women were sort of treated like objects, like dogs. Uh, If a man wanted to divorce a woman, he would just say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. That was it. And Jesus treated women with the same respect that God the Father treats women. And maybe that's why they were so attracted to him. They were intrigued by this man who was not like all the others. Women hold also a special place in the spread of the gospel story. Now, we'll get to our point in a second, but I just need to have some background just so that you'll know where I'm coming from. It was the women, not the men, who were the first to know about Jesus' coming. Mary and Elizabeth. (laughs) They knew it before anybody did. And it was the women who were the first to know that Jesus had risen from the tomb. The men were dumbfounded at first until they saw it for themselves. Thomas, he even had to go and put his fingers in the holes before he would believe it. Pilate and the chief priests had to float a phony story to cover up the fact that Jesus was no longer in the tomb But they could not stand against the testimony of the women. And down through history, the gospel has gone to most parts of the world, largely due to the efforts and the testimony of women. Women in missions. Women were the first converts of the Apostle Paul on his missionary journey to Macedonia in the book of Acts. Lydia, the seller of purple, was the first convert. And she lived in Philippi, and the gospel spread like wildfire in Philippi, largely because of her testimony. All the doubters would have had to do was come up with the body of Jesus, and everything would have been just leveled. That would have been it. Habeas corpus. Show us the body, and that will be the end of Christianity. They couldn't because, or they didn't because they couldn't. And they could have proven that these women were liars, but they didn't because they couldn't. And if you prove the women are liars, you also have to prove that the apostles were liars because they all were eyewitnesses to the risen Christ, in addition to those over 500 other people at the time who saw the risen Christ. You know, it wasn't like a bunch of kooks seeing Elvis at a motel. This happened, and it is one of the best documented facts of human history. Now, among those who supported Jesus and cared for him during the earthly ministry were these two ladies, Mary and Martha, two wonderful women who I think represent two different but equally important aspects in the life of a church. Because in most of us, there is a little bit of that Mary, and then there is a little bit of the Martha, some one more than other. And I would like to point out at this point that even though this church is elder-led and even though our bylaws say that these elders and deacons be men, I must say, where would we be without you ladies? Can you picture what sort of nightmarish church this would be if we did not have an army of good-hearted women to give our boys that merciful guidance that we often lack, the artistic touch, the intuitive wisdom that we often need, when we're bullying ahead in our manlike blunderings. Our women give us an atmosphere of nurturing and caring which would not be there if it were left up to the he-men. <laughs> we're good at fixing the roof and landscaping and moving tables, but I have to notice that the people in the church who are teaching the children are mainly women. Not all, not all. 
And I also notice the people who pray with the most passion are sometimes the women. They have a heart. They know how to shed a tear when it's called for. Not all, but many women who are at the heart of our ministry here. And they serve quietly without a lot of fanfare. You know what our potluck luncheons would look like if it weren't for the women? <laughs> Beef jerky, deer bologna, craft <laughs> instant macaroni and KFC, <laughs> fried egg sandwiches, extra crispy. Instead of flowers and decorative arrangements, when you see here and there, there'd be things like animal heads and antlers sticking out all over the place. <laughs> Toolboxes left in the aisles, mud on the carpets. We'd have color clashes that would knock the birds out of the sky as they flew overhead. <laughs> Our bathrooms would look like the inside of a submarine that's been buried in a swamp. Now, I don't want to neglect the men who also serve in the children's ministry or in any other ministry. I'm just saying, remember the gals. Many of the ministry in the church, uh, the ministries that are really making a difference are being headed up by women right now. So we'll just keep that in mind. And it's not just Mother's Day, because many of the people who serve heartily are not yet mothers. Some of you younger ladies, too. So, and further, I would say that it'd be very hard to be a pastor of a church. In fact, it would be impossible <laughs> without the good-hearted intentional support of his wife. And Pastor Hoy, he's not here today, but if he were, I would say, Pastor, you are what you are because of Jennifer. So, with that just being recognized, we come to this um, story, the snapshot here in Luke 10, which actually happened, Mary and Martha, the sisters from Bethany, and we're busy doing the two things that women in church seem to excel at, worship and service. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. I don't know the exact picture here, but the concept is that she was doing nothing but listening to him. And Martha, for her part, was serving in the kitchen, putting together some kind of meal for everybody. I noticed that Lazarus was not mentioned in this exchange. In that day, it was typical for the men to gather and talk spiritual talk while the women did all the work. <laughs> I don't know. It isn't told us where Lazarus was at this point. But he may have uh, been sitting listening to Jesus just like Mary. He may have just kind of been bored with the whole thing, <laughs> saying nothing exciting ever happens here in Bethany uh, with Messiah sitting right next to him. Uh, and within a few days, he himself would be dead and have to be rescued from the grave by this Messiah who was sitting in his living room. So, back to our potluck supper. We see Martha, sweat streaming from her brow over a hot stove in the kitchen just at the moment when she realized that she was doing this all by herself. And there was Sis out there taking it easy in her eyes hobnobbing with the boys. So she was doing a slow burn, you know, banging pots, throwing towels, irritated that her sister was sitting and listening to Jesus while she was suffering martyrdom in the kitchen. And uh, so she called out probably in an emotional way, Lord, don't you care? Does Jesus care when my heart is torn by some? I don't know the song. Do you know it? Does Jesus care? Oh, yes, he cares. His heart is touched by my grief. Through the long days weary and the long nights dreary, I know my Savior cares. Yeah, he cares. But sometimes when we're in our emotional states, we get in trouble and we forget that Jesus cares. Make my sister come and help. I need the table set. I need butter out. I need to get the serving spoons with all these dishes, and bread needs to be sliced. Chop, chop. Order her to come and help me. And Jesus didn't do what she expected. <laughs> 
Jesus never does what people are expecting him to do. Well, rarely. To the man who warned his brother to share the inheritance with him, Jesus said, I don't do that, man. I don't arbitrate personal disputes like that. Beware of greed, because that is a worse problem than being cheated out of your inheritance, being shortchanged on things that aren't going to last. Watch your heart. To the woman with the alabaster jar who broke it and poured the essence on Jesus' feet when all the men were shouting and rebuking her for such waste, he said, let her alone. She's done a beautiful thing on me. She has come to anoint my body for its burial. She has done what she could. She knew when she was pouring that ointment on his body that he was about to be tortured to death for the sins of, of man. And Jesus could have said, what have you done lately, Pharisee? What have you done? You know, we can't do everything. Can't do everything. But let it be said that we did what we could. To the rich young ruler who inquired, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, simple, just keep the whole law from birth to death, and you're in. And the man said, no problem, I've already done that, now what? What next? And Jesus said, oh yeah? Oh really? Well then you won't mind selling everything you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. And suddenly the, the boy remembered an important dentist appointment <laughs> and uh, went away sad, it says, because Jesus didn't kowtow to the rich like they expected him to do. The rich man was used to having people step and fetch it when he called. And they did, and Jesus didn't do that. He was used to having people say, right this way, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Oh, we would love to have you in our church, sir. And Jesus says, you lay down everything and you come and follow me. or And you come on my terms or not at all. So... When inquirers come to Jesus, he sometimes tells them things that they don't want to hear. And they have to lay things down to come to Jesus. We've got to lay down our sin, those things that we hold on to. And Jesus said, foxes have holes, birds have their nests, but the Son of Man does not even have a, a pillow to lay his head in this world. And it may be that if you follow Jesus, you may not have a place to sleep and you may not even have, get to keep your life. The way it's going now, who knows what's going to happen in this world. But we get to keep our life for eternal benefit. We lose our life, but not our soul. So Jesus' response to Martha was a little jarring, and many sermons have been preached about it, saying that Mary was the virtuous one of the whole pack, and that while Martha was uh, in the kitchen, with her pots boiling over and butter melting, she was sinning because she had not had her devotions. And really, they make Martha out to be some, something that really the scripture does not, does not condemn her. Um, Jesus only said... Martha, you are cumbered about with many worries, but only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen that good part, and it will not be taken away from her. Let's not read into this that Martha had sinned by serving. And you know, it it doesn't say this, but after Jesus had spoken a while to Mary, it is possible, even, even likely, that he may have said to her, okay, now, Get up and and help your sister. Or she may have done that on her own. After the uh, devotional was over, she may have gotten up on her own because it often follows that those who listen to Jesus are also good at service. It just follows. And it's good to hem the day in prayer and devotions first so things don't come unraveled in our workaday world. But... In defense of Martha, somebody is going to have to do some work sometime. Somebody is going to have to cook the meal. Somebody is going to have to do the breeder's desk out there. 
Somebody's going to have to do the, the things that need doing in the church. And the Lord knows that you can't run a church with everybody sitting around worshiping all day long and never doing anything. But he also knows that it's human nature to plunge into activities without taking time to worship and pray. And that's not good either. Worship drives the church. We center our service around church. We center our service around the Bible, and even our songs point to him. But in defense of Martha, if sitting at the feet of Jesus was all we ever did, the grounds would not be tended, the dishes would pile up in the kitchen, the rooms would collect dust, the roof would leak, and we'd need snowshoes to get here in the winter because nobody would have thought to call the snow plow. When we cook, when we clean, when we evangelize, when we serve in the church, God looks at both the work and the heart. Does the attitude match up with what we're doing? And that is where Mary was strongest. But in defense of Martha, what if the attitude isn't perfect? What if we are guilty of performing our tasks with an imperfect heart attitude? Is there anything left for going through the motions? Now let's talk about that for a minute because I think a lot of us go through the motions and we are, we feel guilty. We feel we're doing something bad when we go through the motions because we must. And those motions are necessary for the life of a church or a home. And we have to do some things. And if it can't be done with a perfect heart, is there something left for someone who at least does the work, even with an imperfect attitude? In defense of Martha, going through the motions does not have to be a bad thing. And there is something to be said for force of habit, if it's a good habit. (laughs) I wonder how many churches that have had to close down in this area would still be open if there was somebody who had gone through the motions. Perhaps the hard attitude would, would have followed if they had just kept at it. I wonder how many marriages can be saved if we can just go through the motions, even if we feel ill-used sometimes and, and taken advantage of sometimes. You know, somebody told me before I was married that marriage is a 50-50 proposition. That is a load of huckapuck. It's, it's sometimes 0-100. There are times when you have to carry the load. And what if we can just do that even if... We aren't perfectly attuned. What if we just go through the motions and get her done? I wonder how many people who are out of work might still have a job if they'd gone through the motions and did what the boss said, even though through clenched teeth. How many of us have gotten speeding tickets when if we had gone through the motions of obeying the speed limit... (laughs) And instead of speeding, even though we didn't do it with a worshipful heart, we'd still have our $200. What about prayer? What about Bible reading? Do we have to wait until we feel the sweetness of the Spirit to open our Bibles and read that passage and read those 10 verses, those 10 chapters? What if prayer and Bible reading is not enjoyable for us because it's hard to read. I've talked to people in this church who almost with tears say, I don't read the Bible like I should because it's hard for me to read. The, the, the words run together and I, I don't seem to be able to get it like you guys. Well, what if you just keep doing it even though it's hard? And maybe the spiritual Insights and blessings will come later if you keep at it and go through the motions, as it were. It's not a sin to go through the motions if the motions are what you ought to do. And sometimes we do have to function uh, sort of on autopilot.
What might happen if everyone in the church was like Mary? We'd all be sweetly listening to the Lord, engrossed in our much Bible study and our book learning, and suddenly the youth would have to use the bus to go on an outing. But the bus wouldn't have been inspected because everybody was too busy, (laughs) you know, with their devotions. And uh, all I'm saying is that there is a time to worship with the babbling brooks and the birdies singing sweetly in the trees. But then there's a time to get out and do what needs to be done. There's a time when we must be merry, and there are times when we must be Martha. Let's look at a passage also in Matthew chapter 17, if you wouldn't mind. Matthew 17. right there at the very beginning. This is the chapter that talks about the the Mount of Transfiguration, and it's remarkable. It says there on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, uh, it is good for us to be here. Uh, If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was yet speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Isn't that what Mary was doing? Listening to him. St. Peter, all he could think of to do was to build something. He wanted to put up a, a shelter. <laughs> Let's build a church here. And what God really wants is not necessarily the building, but to, for people to listen to his son, his only begotten son, who died on the cross for sinners and rose again. You know, if we're going to listen to Jesus, we are certainly going to have to listen to him saying to us, you need to be saved. You need to be born again to receive anything in the kingdom of heaven. You won't get within a country mile of God unless you are right with me, Jesus will say to us. But in defense of Martha, at some point we have to come down from the mountaintop experience, as it were, into the valley of pain and drudgery. And there are many of us in this church now that are in the valley of pain and drudgery and mourning. There are many of us who are about to lose loved ones, and we need to pray for them. And there are many people who can use a a helping hand. And we have to not think of ourselves as so spiritual that we don't have to do any of that messy stuff. We can't always live like a monk in a cloister far from the maddening crowd. What Mary learns at the feet of Jesus must be practiced in the marketplace of Martha. What we learn on the mountaintop we must carry with us into the Saturday morning clothing ministry and the home and the workplace, the city streets, the voting booth, and the other places of the world. We must be salt and light in the midst of a crooked generation. And, you know, we get irritated sometimes because people don't behave themselves out in the world. Well, how can you expect them to behave like, like Christians when they're not Christians? And they have never been enlightened by Jesus and by the Holy Spirit. Naturally, they're going to behave badly because we used to behave badly before we came to Christ, didn't we? And we forget how it used to be. I remember as a young boy, tortured by the fact that I was going to die one day and I didn't know what was going to happen. 
and I was afraid. And the gospel came to me at just the right time when I was thinking to myself, you know, it would be worth anything I had to do, whether it be crawl up Mount Everest on my knees, it would be worth anything I had to do to get to heaven. And God was saying, there's nothing you can do. I've done it all. And all I want you to do, Bill, is believe what I have said and done, especially with respect to my only begotten son, whom I sent for you. In old Israel, there were a sect of Jews called the Essenes. They felt that to serve God properly, they needed to shut themselves off from the dirty, frothing crowds and live in little cubicles exercising extreme self-discipline and study. And uh, they, there was Mary, you know, as it were, listening to the feet of Jesus. But, you know, they didn't just lie around doing nothing. They had a society in which they had to clean, they had to cook, and they had to do things. And they contributed to the society also in the copying of the scriptures. I mean, you talk about going through the motions, the extreme detail and the carefulness with which these Essenes used in the copying of the scriptures. You know, there used to be one man standing in front of everybody else as they were sitting on their wooden benches, pen in hand, with their little inkwell. And he would say, in, I, N. They would all write, I, N. And then the rector would walk around and inspect the word on everybody's sheet. And then after he was, would make sure that everybody had written in correctly, he would go back up front and he would then say, the. And everybody would write T-H-E. And then the rector would walk around up the benches and down, inspecting every man's word to make sure that it was correct. Then he would get up in front and say, beginning. And they would all write, beginning. And then he would walk up and down and make sure that they had spelled it correctly and that everything was right. And if one of the poor monks forgot to put the two ends in the, in the beginning, he would say, you're wrong. He would have to crumple up the whole thing and start over. <laughs> this was the kind of care that was taken to write the scriptures in the very beginning before computers so that we could read and have our Bible studies at Pine Brook with the babbling brooks and the nice pine trees and the lovely scenery. Mary and Martha. Sometimes we must be Mary, sometimes we must be Martha. And we owe a great deal in large part to these Essenes who, like Martha, underwent their extreme drudgery and hardship and monotony and writer's cramp as they copied the scriptures for us. Paul told Timothy, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them, for if you do, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Doctrine, that's Mary, listening at the feet of Jesus. Your life, your life, that's Martha, working out her faith in the real world. Yes, worship first, worship first listening at the feet of Jesus first. Keep the relationship with Jesus sweet and up-to-date at all costs. That is the one thing that is needful. That is that good part which shall not be taken away from us. But then comes time to grab the serving towel and help the sister. For there are many at the banquet hungry and ready to eat. And you know what I found out? When people are well-fed, They look for Mary. But when people are hungry and needy, who do they look for? Martha. 
Let's pray. Lord, when we sit at your feet, it equips us to serve better and to be better. But Martha was not sinning when she was serving. And we need to remember that. Help us in those times when we do a function perfunctorily on autopilot because our heart attitude has not caught up with us. We get the point, Lord, that we must do both. And if there is a lesson in that, I think, and it's a simple point for us to grasp, help us in the balancing out of being both Mary and Martha in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.